morning, brethren. Good to see everybody that's here. We're glad that you're here. Um, I really appreciate these fellows, I tell you, that come in and lead singing. Uh, I never think about it till we start singing how usually I just have no idea how my voice is going to be. And I'm just up here cracking and everything else. Hope I didn't distract the song leader too much. <clears throat> but uh, that kind of gives me a preview of what I'm probably going to sound like once I start trying to talk. Good to see everybody. Failed to mention that Ed Troxel is not feeling well. He's not here this morning. And so we certainly will miss him. And uh, we'll talk uh, about an elders meeting. Uh, later on, we try to figure out if he's going to feel any better or not. But it's good to see you, and we're, we're glad that you're here. It's been a couple of weeks. Actually, it's been three since we talked about Christian apologetics. It's kind of something that I want to spend some time with. Certainly appreciate uh, David Francis's prayer, uh, talking about that uh, this is new territory for those of us who got a little age on us. Uh, for our younger folks, then, you know, this is pretty much the norm. This is what you've grown up with. But as our society has changed quite a bit in the last 40, 50 years, those of us that have a little bit more uh, age, uh, notice I said a little, little bit, uh, uh, have noticed changes. And we've noticed some what seem to be just, you know, big changes. And so one of the reasons we want to talk about a Christian apologetics is because it hasn't changed. God is who God is. How our society looks at God or fails to look at God uh, may change from time to time, but we as Christians still have to give that apology. An apology is not that we're sorry that something is the case that it is, but an apologetics, the word that there means to give a defense, it's to give argumentation, it's to show why you believe in what you believe. Before I go much further, before I forget it, this over here is our new wing that we've built. This is for all the convalescent folks. We've got people over here with all these. Uh, uh, it's good to see them, though. Boy, I'm glad that they're here. But And that's a good thing. If you ever have trouble and you don't feel like you'd be comfortable in the pews here, we have the front pews. No, we wouldn't want to sit there. But we also have over here, you can spread out a little bit if you got a broke leg or something of that nature. And we, we're so glad that people are that motivated to be at services that are having those kind of problems. Very quickly, let's do just a little bit of review. We said that our society today is kind of like the society that you run across in Acts chapter 17. Well, what's the difference? Well, in Acts chapter 2, when you have that first gospel sermon being preached, Peter is preaching to a bunch of folks who believe in the God of the Bible. They believe in the God of heaven, and so he turns to the Bible, and he says this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel, and he's quoting from Joel chapter 2, as he's preaching, Joel wrote 800 years before. Well, that probably wouldn't do you a whole lot of good in a pagan culture that knows nothing of Judaism or the Old Bible, the Old Testament. But it's just great with those Jews who studied the Bible. And he not only speaks of Joel, but then he goes and quotes from the Psalms. Three points that he makes about the Christ, that he was supposed to suffer, that he was going to be resurrected, that his soul would not be left in corruption or in hell to see corruption. And so he quotes from those, and those Jews, they are motivated. They understand the scriptures and what that's talking about. And they said, you know what, that's right. They know the Bible, and so they looked at their Bibles, if you will. And here Peter's preaching Bible, and they said, that's right. The God of heaven who's given us the Old Testament scriptures, as they would say, these points are right because God has said this in his holy word. Well, today, we got folks that don't really believe a whole lot about the Bible. As a matter of fact, in Christian apologetics, one of the things that you'll look at, and we will, is the fact that the Bible is from God. Many folks would just straight out deny that. They'd say, as Freddie Clayton would say, you're full of blue mud. You know, that's what they'd say. It's, uh, you, you have no idea. It's hogwash. What in the world are you talking about? You've got the Muslims that have the Koran. You've got people that have the, the Bible to say it's the word of God. You've got the Hindus with their Vedas. You have all these different religions with their holy writings. What makes you think that the Bible is from the word of God? So we have to give an apology. We have to give a defense. And it's very easy to do. But if you don't know how to do it, it's very difficult. I remember when I first started coming to grips with the fact that I needed to quit this way and down a pew in a church building somewhere and actually start living what I believed 
or just back up and punt and quit because I was not doing anything except being a bad influence on those around about me that were trying to do something. So I delved into apologetics. I went to school to study and to make sure and to prove to myself that the Bible is the Word of God, and I want to be able to share some of that with you. But that's what you find in Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, Paul has been left at Athens. He's had some trouble. These Jews, you remember, are chasing him everywhere. And so he's going with them. And he's running from them, if you will. So he finds himself in Athens. Now, Athens, does they're not a, there's not a huge Jewish population there. It's pagan. You can go there today and you can see that, you know, that uh, big old Parthenon where they had all those gods in there. And that's where Paul goes. He goes up to what place called Mars Hill or Areopagus, as it's called as well. And he preaches to these pagans. Well, he can't say, Joel said this. Or in the book of Psalms, it says this. Because they don't care. They have no idea what the Old Testament is. So it means nothing to them. What does he do? He starts talking about creation. He starts talking about the fact that you are. You know, that, that requires an explanation. Simply the fact that you exist requires an explanation. Why am I here? And so that's why we're talking about this. With some of your friends now, you won't be able to start an Acts 2 conversation with them. They don't care anything about the Bible. They don't care uh, about what the Bible says. It meant to them, you might as well be quoting a comic book. They just don't see any difference. Others, you'll find in our area in particular, they're quite convinced that the Bible is the Word of God. Good, you can have that Acts 2 conversation with them. You can go to the Scriptures. But with others, you're going to have to start talking about the fact that there's creation, the fact that there is a, an earth, and all, all of this. That's how come that you have the, the idea of evolution today. You had a bunch of atheists that said, we've got to come up with something. And so that was their line of reasoning. So we are more in line in America as a whole of an Acts 17 society than we are of an Acts chapter 2. Didn't used to be the case, is now. Is now. If you would have started uh, talking to people about the Bible back when this country was first founded, uh, then you would have had folks that knew the Bible. As a matter of fact, they quoted the Bible, they read the Bible. Our former presidents, John Quincy Adams, for instance, said he started out every morning and would read three chapters out of the Bible before he did anything else. And you know what he told his son, who also became a, a president? He said, it's one of the best things you can do. Puts you in mindset. It, it gives you an idea. It puts you in submission. You understand who you are and what you are. We don't have presidents doing that now. You see, we, we've moved. But uh, that's just all we need to do is understand that. Can't have those same conversations we did in times past, or at least figure out the person you're trying to talk to, where they are. Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? He is a pagan. He worshiped pyramids and gods of the dead and cats and mummies and things of that nature. He didn't know anything about the God of heaven. He said, who's Jehovah? Who's the Lord that I should obey his voice? I will not. I know not the Lord. Neither will I let Israel go. So he needed more. Of course, he, he got a lot more, too. We talked about the four different ideas of, uh, of belief, atheism, skepticism, agnosticism, deism. Uh, we won't bother to plow that ground again. But we did talk about the fact that it's innate in men to worship something. It's innate in us. We're born with that desire. In Acts 17, as Paul is preaching to this bunch of folks who you know, have a God for every occasion, if you will, he says, for in him we live and move and have our being. He's talking about the God of heaven, as certain also of your own poets have said. For we also are his offspring. Ancient cultures, they weren't atheists. Ancient cultures, uh, there's never been a culture that didn't have religion, that didn't have some type of worship of deity, uh, even if that deity turns out to be just the idea of the cosmos, as you'll have with some of your Buddhists and so forth, the idea of nirvana or heaven, or becoming. And even they believe in an afterlife, and you come back as this or that, depending on how you did in the life before. That's why they won't eat cows, and some of them are so, uh, you know, uh, conscientious about life that they even wear a little napkin over their face so they won't breathe in a bug, which they believe could have been uh, a human being at one time. Uh, not, not anything like you find in, in the Bible. Well, why do people turn to unbelief? We'll talk about atheism now. That's what we want to talk about. Unbelief, folks who just straight out say there is no God. We said a couple weeks ago, no respect for authority. That's where mommies and daddies are so important. 
fathers, your responsibility is to raise up your children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Ladies, I'm afraid a lot of times that burden is passed to you. Uh, for many years, I've noticed, and when I was younger, uh, you know, ladies would take their children to church, and a lot of times the men wouldn't go. Uh, and, you know, it's a shame because it's their responsibility. But what happens with that, you have what's over, an overall just lack of respect for authority. If there's not a father in the home, uh, if the mother's got her hands full and can't, you know, give the type of authority, you have just this lack of authority. And so once there's a lack of respect for authority, uh, you know, people that don't respect their parents, if they don't have any, then they can't. But they usually won't respect their teachers. They won't respect their principals. They don't care anything about the police. Uh, and they certainly don't care about a supreme being being God. They just have no uh, respect for authority. They want to change everything that they possibly can. Uh, you know, that's the idea of liberalism and conservatism. Now, I'm not talking about politics or even religion. I'm not trying to label anything. But the idea of liberalism is you do anything you want. The idea of conservatism is there's a way that you do things. And you stay to that particular pattern or the conservative way of doing things. And that's basically the, the idea of liberalism and conservatism, be it religion, be it politics, whatever. But you have no respect for authority. In other words, do what you want. Number two, an inordinate pride. That's another problem. Men, well, we have a tendency to think a lot of ourselves. And in doing so, we're not too worried about what God may say. And if God has said something, at least uh, that's what the Bible says, uh, well, we think something different. And a lot of times we'll go with what we have said because we think we are uh, superior to God, and you see this playing out all the time uh, in religion. For just for, for a quick illustration, in the Bible it says in First Timothy chapter two at verse nine, the Apostle Paul speaking, inspired of God. Now the Holy Spirit speaking through the Apostle, he's writing inspired words. This is God's message. Same thing Jesus would say. Um, you know, whatever the apostles are saying, the inspired men are saying, it's the same thing as if I'm saying. It's the doctrine of Christ. He says, I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the men. In other words, she is not to stand up and, pro and publicly proclaim uh, Bible teaching, God's teaching, if you will, over the man, or to have a position over the man in the assembly of the church. Uh, some people say, well, that's just not consistent with what we're doing today. Uh, that's old-fashioned. We're not going to do that. Even though God has said, this is what you're going to do. Uh, they say, no, not so. And so they, they do things like undermine the authority of Scripture. They say, well, that's Paul. That's not God. Uh, Jesus didn't say that. Well, <laughs> that's exactly what Jesus did say. The Holy Spirit was going to bring these men into remembrance. He was going to bring them, guide them into all truth. Paul would even write, whoever so thinks himself to be religious, let him acknowledge the things I've written unto you are the word of God, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. A lot of people don't do that. They don't care about that. They say, look, this is today. This is what we want to do. And so the pride of man and that look where we are, we ought to be able to do this. Why can't we do this? And uh, you have that. Well, number three, wish to be free from moral responsibility. In other words, first God in heaven, he's going to hold me to a standard. He's going to hold me accountable. And there's some things that God has said that I'm just not real big on. In other words, I, you know, I want to smoke pot. And I'm not trying to do it for medically reasons or anything like that, but I like to do that and listen to Pink Floyd and cruise around in my automobile. You know, it's cool. That's how I party. Uh, and I want to do that. And so, you know, uh, if I say there's a God in heaven and God says stay free, you know, stay away from intoxicants, uh, that doesn't roll with how I want to roll. So I want to get rid of that. Or maybe of a sexual nature. Notice this quote from a fellow by the name of Aldous Huxley. If you do any kind of apologetic study, any kind of atheism. This guy was a, uh, he was a go-to for these folks maybe, you know, 40, 50 years ago in particular. He did a lot of writing, and so that's why he's so easy to quote. He just did a lot. He was prolific, uh, but he's been, he's been gone a while. But anyway, in his article, and this is old, Confessions of a Professed Atheist, he says, he argued that belief in God and viewing the world as having meaning were hindrances to sexual freedom. We can't do what we want to do sexually if we admit that there's a God in heaven and God has told us what we can do and what we can't do when it comes to sexual relations. Things like fornication, you know, where a man and a woman are not married, yet they act as though they are. The Bible says that's fornication. You can't do that. But people want to do that. And I thought it was interesting. We were able to uh, attend. Uh, we tried to go to the Gatlinburg Church. Uh, anytime we're visiting up there, and uh, one of our elders' fathers, Roger Comstock, preaches up there. And uh, 
he had read an article in the Christian Chronicle. Now, the Christian Chronicle is a, is a paper that's put out by Abilene Christian University. Uh, and uh, let me say this before I talk about the article. They have always just tried to report whatever is happening with anybody who calls themselves a Churches of Christ or Disciples of Christ or maybe even some Christian church stuff. They've just said, hey, listen, we don't care what it's about. We don't care where it's going, but we'll report it. And so Brother Comstock said he read this article in here, and he said it was all he could do. He wanted to preach on it that morning, you know, Sunday morning. But uh, he said, I thought, thought about it and said it was probably better not to because it, it's sort of upsetting. Well, it's way upsetting. Uh, this article says love wins at same-sex conference. Uh, and basically what you had was a bunch of members of the church who have come together and want to talk about same-sex marriage and things of this nature and how that we uh, have approached that, uh, they would say, incorrectly, and that we ought to be loving. In other words, we shouldn't judge someone uh, because of the particular relationship they are in. If they're married to somebody of the same sex, things of that nature, we ought to just, you know, ignore that, if you will. Uh, maybe talk about it. Maybe that's not the best thing to do. But whatever you do, don't judge that matter. Well, folks, we're not trying to judge anybody. It's not our job. Jesus even said, I judge no man. You know, the Father is appointed one to judge. Well, that's going to be Christ one day. Uh, but right now, we don't do that. But what we do, do, is we preach the Bible. And the Bible is very specific about certain things. Under the patriarchal law, we understand that relations between males and relations between females. In other words, same-sex relations has been prohibited uh, since the beginning. Sodom and Gomorrah, Genesis 19. Uh, under the patri uh, under what we call the Mosaic Law, in other words, the law to the Jews, when God gave man a written uh, Bible, it was there too in Leviticus. Man shall not lie with man as he lies with a woman. It was wrong. In the New Testament, some people try to tell you the New Testament doesn't say anything about it. Well, whoever that is is just simply not reading their New Testament. Romans chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, talk about the idea that this is against God's will, has been and continues to be. So that's what we preach and teach on that. And in the church, in order to have fellowship with the church, one must have fellowship with God. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. But we have to be walking in that light. Someone who is walking contrary to the will of God, particularly in something so, uh, you know, uh, obviously obvious to see, uh, is not in fellowship with God. So therefore, uh, the church can't just say, well, hey, look, we're not going to pay any attention to that. And so this was a conference, and it goes on to report about that. And so Brother Comstock, rightfully so, was upset about that. But I did want to draw, uh, saying that same thing, uh, in this same uh, book, uh, newspaper, it talks about, is progressive Christianity dangerous? And I appreciate the seminar that they give some facts on uh, because progressives basically are just saying, look, we've defined things in the old times by a certain way. We don't need to do that anymore. What we need to do now is, you know, redefine things and uh, love wins out. Well, folks, the love of God requires that we preach and teach against what sin. Jesus went to the cross and died because of love, his love for us. There's, a, there's things attached, there's strings attached, if you will, to being in fellowship with God. We have to do what God would have us to say. So a lot of people, well, they just want to do what they want to do, and so they just don't care what God has to say. And that was in a, a magazine from 1966. That's, so that's how long we've been dealing with this. Psalms 14, 1, what does the Bible say? The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. In other words, they want to do what they want to do. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. In other words, folks are not interested. A lot of folks are not interested in doing what's right. So don't be surprised with that. Well, number four, a new one, says, Because their faith in someone who professes to be a devout believer in God has been shattered. That has broken the faith of some folks. That's why it's so important that we let our light so shine. But brethren, that we stay consistent. People watching you, young people watch you. Uh, I remember a couple of preachers that I thought so much of, their writings and so forth. I never met them personally. But later on when I found some other things that they had said, it bothered me deeply. And, uh, you know, that, that's profound. It can really hurt your, like, how could, he, how could he understand this and yet hold that position? So it really, really bothered me. 
Uh, but you know, um, that's people. That is people. And if you put your faith in people, you're going to run into some problems. If you put your faith in Abraham, the father of the faithful, you'd have had some problems, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? Abraham had a trouble with, uh, with uh, telling the truth all the time. What if you'd been running partners with Peter? And there Peter denies the Lord three times. That would have probably hurt. And uh, you can't imagine, I mean, you can't imagine today in our society when you have so many young people growing up in the Catholic Church who thought so much of this, this priests and things and then find themselves being abused, what it could do to somebody. Now, I'm not saying that religion is right. But what I'm saying is that's the idea. When somebody who says they're religious uh, acts so irreligious. Well, moving along. Proverbs 25, verse 19 says, Confidence in an unfaithful man. In other words, somebody who says they're a Christian, yet they don't act that way. And says, In time of trouble is like a broken tooth. You ever had a tooth that broke? You know how sensitive it becomes? It becomes your number one priority, doesn't it? You'll either get that thing fixed or you'll get a bunch of ore gel or a foot out of joint. Uh, you're not going to be able to walk. It's something you're going to think about constantly. So that's what he says. Confidence in an unfaithful man, the Bible says. Well, the problem of suffering. We want to talk about this for a moment because this is the number one argument of atheists. This was a fellow that came up with this, uh, Epicurus, uh, said if God wishes to prevent evil and cannot, he is not all powerful. Now, Epicurus, we're talking about Greece. We're talking about way back when. Says he's not all powerful. Says if he can prevent evil but will not, then he's not good. Uh, if he can, has the power to uh, eliminate evil and does it, then uh, he's not all powerful. If he is all powerful and doesn't eliminate evil, then he's not all good. And that was his idea, and he just thought that was the greatest thing since cotton candy and that he could just shut down anybody that believed in God. Well, that's, that's just not true. Uh, first of all, let's, let's, let's think about this. Love allows freedom of choice. Imagine a God who create beings such as humans and then make them robots. I can't do what I want to do. I have to do exactly what God wants me to do. No freedom of choice. That's just not a loving thing to do. But the Bible says that God is love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. Thus, God allows freedom of choice. And number one, A, there's like A, B, C. If A is true, B is true, then C is true. Where there is freedom of choice, there's a possibility of failure. A finite being, me and you, we can make a bad choice. You ever made a bad choice? <laughs> You know, where does the list begin? You know, I have freedom of choice, but a lot of times I've made, and I'll just be honest with you, sometimes they've been really stupid choices. I've looked back over that and like, what was I thinking? That's, that was so, why would I do But I did it. Well, strong or wrong choices can entail evil and suffering. Uh, if, even if uh, choices, uh, you know, uh, at the time I think they're good, but it turns out that they're not. Uh, you know, it's, it's not good. <laughs> it's not good. Thus, where there is freedom of choice, there is inevitable consequences that finite beings must be allowed to suffer uh, the consequences of their choice. With that in mind, the idea of suffering, though, to ask this question, to ask this question, you know, suffering, what is, you know, if, if, if there is a God, why doesn't he stop it? Well, to ask that question uh, is to answer it. What do I mean by that? Well, the etymology of the word, it's, it's, it's a Latin word. It comes from sub, which means to be under or below, and fair, to bear. In other words, to bear under. You're, you're suffering through something. You're, you're suffering. You're bearing under something. Well, uh, who's to say that it's suffering? What do we mean by suffering? Uh, well, if you, uh, you, know, you get sick, you're suffering. Uh, if you get killed, you're suffering. But when you look at the animal world, you see ants. Ants die by the gazillions every day, but nobody says, you know, boy, those poor little ants, you know, they're suffering. Uh, it's not looked at as that way. Uh, defined, experience, or be subject to something bad. So when you say that suffering is wrong, that God ought to stop suffering, you, you put a standard. In other words, there's a standard of, of not suffering and a, stu and a standard of suffering. Well, who says what that standard is? In other words, we're saying there is something, there is something tangible, real, called evil. And this is one of the ways that, uh, you know, Thomas Warren uh, proved to Anthony Flew that there is real objective. I mean, it is their moral evil. And he was able to do that in a fine fashion because Anthony Flew 
had been in the World War II as a British soldier. He had seen firsthand what the Nazis were doing to the Jews, and Thomas Warren basically said, was killing those six million Jews objective, moral, evil. In other words, always wrong. And Anthony Flew had to come out and say, yes, it's, and then he tried to say it because they broke British law or German law. They weren't under, the German law didn't say that. German law said kill them. They weren't under British law because they was German. So whose law were they under? Well, folks, they were under God's law. Uh, when you have people being prosecuted today for raping children, uh, you know, uh, what are they breaking? Uh, you know, I don't care what country, most countries have laws against that, but that's, that's breaking a known law of God. So uh, when you say, well, people suffer. Well, what, make, what makes you think they suffer? Maybe that's just the way it's supposed to be. Uh, you know, that's just how people are. This is this world we live in. It's all an accident anyway. There's no God. We're just lucky dirt. What do you mean suffer? And that I think you can make some hay if you can get people to see, well, the whole idea of suffering says that there's some kind of standard. There's some kind of standard which to appeal to. First of all, this idea of freedom of choice. Folks, it, it's one of the main reasons that people suffer. Uh, I make decisions. You make decisions. If a man steals and he gets arrested, what's going to happen? He's going to go to prison in this country sometimes. Uh, he's going to suffer for that choice. Uh, if a man goes into a, a beer joint and uh, drinks until he just absolutely doesn't know where he's at and then goes out and climbs into that 3,000-pound vehicle and then goes out there and kills somebody, People are going to suffer because of his choice. He's going to suffer. It could very well kill him. But the consequences that we sometimes suffer because of other people's choices. I know that's happened to you. You have had things happen to you that somebody else instigated. Somebody's made a choice. And maybe they thought they were absolutely correct. They got after you, said you shouldn't have done that. You were wrong. And they've given you grief, maybe got you fired. There's no telling what all can happen. Come to find out they were mistaken. They made a choice, and you suffered as a result of that choice. Well, bad choices that led and are leading to disease. Isn't it amazing that uh, STDs are on the rise in this great country? And, folks, that's a choice. That's a choice. Um, STDs, uh, people have made choices along this line. We're starting now to have a lot of the diseases that we once had uh, wiped out pretty much in this country are coming back to this country and a lot of it has to do with decisions our government has made as far as letting folks in these uh, third world countries come in and bringing these uh, you know diseases back so you know that that's not good uh, bad choices that led and are leading to disease think about the ultimate bad choice the garden of eden where men had uh, you know access to this tree of life were to live forever but yet Sickness and death came in as a result of sin. One of the interesting things is that in a lot of, uh, they've dug up some things, and I probably ought to make a slide on this. I think we will uh, when we go over this in detail. But, uh, you know, the tree of life, the Garden of Eden, you know, there's a Chaldean am amulet they found that's, that's like a stamp, you know, that you'd seal something with. And on it is a man and a woman under a tree, and, that there's a, and then there's a snake crawling out. Uh, by that. What do you think? There's no writing on it whatsoever. What do you think they were saying? <laughs> Where did that come from? Well, yeah, it came from the Bible and the idea of that early uh, the, of the Garden of Eden. Uh, think about Earth's vol volatility for a moment. Well, we don't have to think much about that. You can just say hurricane and we all get an idea. Man, sometimes the weather can get cranked up and it can do some crazy things. Wipe complete cities out. The fires going on in California now, I mean, it's dry. The winds are blowing those things. People are dying. Entire cities are being annihilated. Uh, Earth's vol uh, volatility. What is that a result of? Why? But, well, the weather pattern. And what, does, what all created that? What changed? You know, why does that take place? You look at a lot of scientists today believe that it has a lot to do with the noadic flood. The noadic flood, you had this great catechism. Uh, cate not a catechism. <laughs> You had this great catastrophe, you know, where the earth, the, the depths of the earth are opened up, uh, volcanoes, rains, the whole earth's covered by water, uh, and, uh, you know, something changed there. 
And what was that a result of? Well, it was a result of sin. And then there's the idea of natural law. Sometimes we, we, sometimes we suffer because there's gravity. And, you know, we've developed these vehicles now that run 70, 80 miles an hour. You know, a lot of times, uh, I don't know if any of you in here drive transfer trucks or not, but, man, if you do, please be careful. I see so many of these trucks, they're just screaming. I have an, a, a, a recreational vehicle that weighs about 22,000 pounds, and I try not to get close to anything <laughs> because it just doesn't stop. You know, it's not like my little old Toyota Corolla I had. You could throw an anchor out and stop on a dime. You know I mean? It just you nothing to stop. You can't. Why is that? Momentum, gravity, these are natural laws. Uh, and once something that weighs 80,000 pounds, like an 18-wheeler, is, is going 70 miles an hour, he ain't going to be able to stop. I wish people in cars would remember that when I see them cutting them off and stuff and on the freeway. That's a natural law. And sometimes you and I suffer because we find ourselves in a situation that it's, it's just nature. It's, it's gravity. It's momentum. It's uh, you're out in the middle of water and you can't swim. You get a cramp. You, you go under the water. You can't. It's just natural law. You can't breathe the water. And so uh, that is the suffering is a major to us. The reason we spend as much time with it as we did this morning. It is a tool that the atheists will try to use to shut you down and try to make you think, well, there's no God. There's no God in heaven. Uh, and here's why. Little babies in Africa are starving to death. And we all know that, you know, 2,000 years ago, Africa was one of the seats of the hierarchy of learning. It was one of the most successful uh, continents in the world, but yet through situations and governments fighting and then lack of government, uh, children today are suffering over there because they are spending all their money on guns and things of that nature, and poor land uh, and so forth, uh, maintenance of the land. So children do indeed sometimes bear the problems of their uh, ancestors. Then we talk finally about atheism believing a, is a belief system, but I tell you what we're going to do, we're going to skip over that this morning for time. I know your time's important and I want to be respectful of it. Perhaps you're here this morning, you've never obeyed the gospel, you don't know even what I'm talking about when I say the gospel. Well, the word comes from a Greek word that means good news. The good news that the God of heaven sent his son, Jesus Christ, to pay a price, to be a sacrifice for you and I. Uh, not an animal sacrifice. The animal blood could not take away the sins of man. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10. Only the blood of Jesus Christ. The one who knew no sin could appease God's wrath. Therefore, he did just that. You have the God of heaven leaving heaven and taking on the form of a man to die for our sins so that you and I would not have to go, not have to be lost. That we can have our sins expunged, be done away with, and that we could be with God in heaven forever. But you have to obey the gospel. What is the gospel? Well, you've got to know that there is a gospel, that there's God in heaven, Jesus is the Son. Jesus said, unless you believe that I am he, you'll die in your sins, John 8, verse 24. Once you believe that, though, there's things that you have to do. You have to, the idea, we use the word repent, but basically it's a turning. I want to do what God would have me to do, not what I've been doing, not following my own plan. Maybe it was even a decent plan. It was a moral plan. I was trying to live right. But I wasn't doing exactly what God says. Well, I want to do what God says. That, that's the idea of repentance. Uh, confess Jesus' name before men. Do you realize that's require, a requirement? Paul says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Jesus would say, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before the Father. But if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before the Father. That's why we say confession is essential. And then the one, the step that puts one into the Christ, baptism, for the remission of your sins. If you're here this morning, we can help you at all in any way. We encourage you to come.